Hi everyone and welcome back to the final video for the HK5 nameplate project in Summer Nights. So we are just going to get cracked right in and then we can get this picture all finished up. So here's where we got to. Last time we had finished off our leaves on the outside of the image. So what we're going to tackle today is basically everything that is left. I've got my little post-it note here with all my colours on just in case I need to pull a pencil back out. We have been using Prismacolor pencils and what we're going to do first of all is we're going to look at these sort of in-between sections that aren't part of this main image around the outside but they aren't part of the pastel background as well. So the idea behind this is to take some pencils that match the pan pastel background. So I have picked out the closest pencils that I can find. And if you look here, we start at the top, I have a purple pencil, which is Parma Violet PC1008. And then I have the Deco Pink, which is PC1014. There we go. When we brought the pink down, it went into this sort of slight orangey colour. So I have beige PC997. And finally, to match the yellow down in this bottom part, I have deco yellow PC1011. And what I'm going to do is work my way around and I'm just going to bring some colour in towards the centre slightly and I'm only going to do it just over the edge in some places. Now this is all about aesthetics, there's no real rule to this. So we're just going to take it section by section and see what we think. So let's get zoomed in and we can make a wee start. So the likes of over here where you can see that there's a section there and to leave that white, it's, I think it's going to look a bit odd. So this is the prime place for us using a little bit of pencil. So we want our pencils to be not quite sharp. We don't want a really pointy point because we want this to be quite soft and the colours aren't going to match exactly. But because they're in quite tight spaces like this, it's not going to be that noticeable. So I really just want to use a light pressure and a wee circular motion and by using this, it means we can build up the colour intensity to best match what's going on in the pan pastel background part out here. So you may not be able to see a huge amount going on just while I get started here, but you will soon see these layers building up. Now there's a teeny weeny little spot in between the string of the beads and that leaf, so I'm going to try not to forget that. You may have to sharpen your pencil up for things like that, but you can always, you know, go back and get that at the end. So here we go, here's a second layer. And that is actually quite a close match for that pan pastel, I'm quite impressed. I always say this, but on the monitor, things look slightly more washed out through a camera lens than they do to the naked eye. So you're, for me looking at this now, this part that I've done in pencil is only very slightly paler than the pastel. You guys won't see that just yet, but we will get there. And you can just go back and start, you know, really, really using your, your eye and your judgment to build up as you're going round and get it as even as you can or as even as you would like it. There you go, you can see it's starting to kind of blend in now. Don't be tempted to press really hard because it's not going to do you any favours. You want complete control over the intensity of this colour so in order to do that, you don't want to squash the tooth of the paper flat because it means you're not going to be able to lay down any more colour. And it is really tempting, especially with Prisma colours. There we go. So that there is a slight difference, but it's not bad at all. And I've got these tiny little spaces in between these petals here as well. So I'm going to tackle those, but I just want to go down here and do the larger areas first before I sharpen up my pencil. Now we're kind of getting into this orange territory here, but I don't think it's going to be that noticeable. So I think on this side I'm going to stick with the pink. And then on the other side I'm going to pop a wee bit of the pink in. And then in underneath the bottom part of this bead I'm just going to use the beige. And there you go, that's blending into the pastel almost seamlessly. You couldn't ask for better than that. Now we've got this wee section in here as well. We're kind of heading into yellow there, but again, I think I'll just stick with the beige. It's such a pale colour that you're really not going to see, you know, it's not one of these things that's going to stick out like a sore thumb. There's an expression my mother would use. 
<laughs> we just want it to not be white. So you can use your judgment and pick your best colours. So if we squish down a bit now, I move things out of the way here. We've got in between our little birdie's legs, so let's go for our deco yellow here. And again, this is almost like a perfect match. You couldn't have asked for a better pencil for that. There you go. And we've got some of these sections in here. Just in some of these little nooks and crannies. And it's not going to take us long to whiz round this. And this is one of these things where it's a wee bit of attention to detail that can make all the difference. Just on the sort of finished aspect of your picture, it just makes it look that little bit more polished. And it just so happens that we're very, very lucky that we've got good colour matches. Okay, I'm going to move around here now. So we're kind of up into this section and we've got this wee bit in here. I, I'm kind of tempted to go for the beige, but I think maybe the yellow might be better. Just in here. And then we're into pink because we've moved a bit further up here. Again, just very gentle layers. We don't want to be doing anything too drastic. You can probably get away with these little tight spaces like this. You could probably get away with pressing a little bit harder and doing less layers just because the, the fact that the spaces are absolutely teeny weeny. And I've got a couple of gaps in here as well. So I'm going to use the beige in there. Uh, I mean, it's, it's negligible. It really is. But it's just I like to keep things kind of tidy. My hand's kind of sore today and... It's, I'm kind of struggling with it a bit, so I'm, I'm trying to turn the paper so that, you know, to find the most comfortable angle for myself. So apologies if we're slightly, a uh, slightly jaunty angle. I think it's the weather. It's it's very humid and we're, we need a storm to sort of clear things out. And I do tend to find that um, that that's when, you know, my hand kind of like stiffens up a little bit. I've also got a f an old foot injury. I had a bull stand on me at one point many, many years ago. And even now when the weather's really damp, my foot still gets stiff and tight. And uh, I can kind of feel it in my foot a little bit as well. So yeah, <laughs> all the joys. Righty-ho, so I'm gonna fill this little section in here as well. tiny little bit in there. Moving on up, we've got more pink round here. This wee bit in here. I know in the, the one of the last videos I did, I talked a bit about the colours that we use most often in pencils that we hardly touch. Deco Pink is another pencil that I really don't use very often. This is the original Deco Pink that came in the first set of Prismacolors that I bought. And uh, yes, yeah, just not really, it's not really been used at all. Um, it's just one of those colours that's it's very wishy washy. <laughs> it's very wishy washy. And I'm sure it has uses, especially for you know, very sort of delicate flowers and things like that, but just not for me. I'm going to sneak into a tiny little bit of the Parma Violet here, just in this top corner, because we're at that sort of transition point where the two are kind of mixing together. So I'm just going to go over the, the deco, the deco, no, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go over the Parma Violet with the, with the, de the deco pink. Oh dear. There we go. And then there's, oh, there's tiny, tiny little spaces in here. I don't even know what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> Let's try. Ooh. Oh. Negligible. Never let it be said that I don't pay attention though. Right, we move up here to our little friend's beak. I'm trying to get the shadow out of the way as well while my hand's still comfortable. The Parma Violet is a little bit darker, so if you're going to do this as well, go easy. Go really easy. But there you go, that's uh, that's turning out just fine and dandy. There we 
There we are. Now these sections in here I'm going to leave because these beads are hanging down quite low and I don't want to pull the colour into this white part because that's part of the reason that everything else pops is having this white area and loads of you will have heard me say it before, the, the white of the page can be your friend sometimes. So we're just going to work our way around the outside here. I think if we were going to do that, we would have come right in with the pan pastel and just left a, you know, a very sort of light oval around the, the text in the middle. But that wasn't really, you know, in the, in the game plan. Right, okay, I'm quite happy with that. Now this is where things get fun. That's just tidied up all the sort of like little loose corners and things. And moving on to these beads now. I'm delighted to tell you I'm going to be using the Gansai Tambay Starry Colours. I have the, the little six set here and I absolutely love these paints. And as you can see, a lot of them have got, you know, a fair bit of dent going on. I have pre-soaked the blue gold. That is the colour that we're going to use. And that's just to, to help sort of loosen off the paint and get us ready for painting. And I'm going to do all of the beads and I'm also going to do the key in this paint as well. So I've got two little brushes here. I have got a number one and uh, you can see it's got quite a tiny tip on it and that's just so that when I go into doing the strings that I can get in nice and tight. Uh, a Royal and Lang Nickel brush it is a five round but it's got quite a pointy point on it and I've again I've picked that for the larger areas but because it has this nice point on it we'll still get a bit of precision which is exactly what we're after. <laughs> I'm sorry guys that just tickled me for some reason. Oh jeez. Okay, so we want our paint to be nice and thick. And if I zoom out very slightly, this will let you see exactly what's going on because I'm going to pop it right down beside me. So I'm just going to wet the tip of this little brush and I'm going to start sort of squishing it about in here. I want to try and keep the paint quite thick because you I often find that if it's too watery bearing in mind that as this is like water based paint you sometimes end up having to go over absolutely everything with a second coat and that's quite time consuming when we're talking about really small detailed areas like this so I'm just going to make a start now obviously I'm going to try and be as as precise as I can I do have a fine liner though and I ha I've used this paint on many many occasions in coloring books and I do find that I, you, you will go outside the lines on an odd occasion or you may like sort of encroach on the line work and it's just nice to have a black fine liner there just to touch up any areas where you might have gone astray slightly the smaller the brush that you use the more control that you're going to have and this is just purely down to practice and also down to patience as well and I'm at the stage now where I'm quite enjoying my watercolour painting and I would say that my brush skills are definitely improving so you know I've, I've got a little bit more confidence than I maybe would have had previously even with a shaky hand today Um, I'm quite happy to carry on and you know make, make a go of it and it's just about taking your time so you can see there, I've had a tiny little splodge over the side. It's not the end of the world and it's, uh, it's, it's easy fixed. If you start going outside the line work, you know, outside the black lines, then, you know, that, that's a different story. That's you, you're kind of in trouble there. <laughs> and you have to start messing about with white Posca pens and one thing or another. But again, it's not, it's not completely unfixable. So don't, you know, it's not like life or death situation here. But obviously the more you take your time and the steadier your hand is, the less you have to correct, you know, after it's dried. So, but the, the good thing as well is the speed that we're going to go at when we're doing this, by the time you've got all the way around your picture, the the area where you started will probably be dry. So you can just keep going. It's not as if you have to go away for half an hour and wait, <clears throat> excuse me, and wait till everything's dried off, which is the part about watercolour I don't like, is the waiting about, waiting for layers to dry and all that kind of stuff. That's like, I'm quite impatient. So I've been looking forward to this all day. I've had a really busy day with work. I am coming into a really busy period with my job. There is a, a disease testing deadline for cattle at the end of October. 
And this is the time of year where people start to realise that they better start doing something about it, <laughs> which I would say probably accounts for about 85% of the farming community. Um, so that means a lot of work for me. And it's the same every year. So I am spending a lot of time just now working on what I call my proper job. Right, quite happy with that. I'm going to come down the way because I want to try and do the right hand side first and it's just in case I put my hand in, um, you know, anything that's still wet. So it makes sense for me to come down a little bit first. So I've been thinking about this since this morning because I do, I do enjoy a little bit of painting with these paints. And I've not really painted recently. I know I mentioned before, I've been really busy and I've not really been arting for myself. And usually every second or third weekend, I just have like a watercolour weekend. And I, I'd get all my housework and everything done, you know, do all my chores and everything. And then I just crack out all my paints and I, I'll sit and paint maybe three or four things over the, you know, the course of the weekend. And I've just not been able to. So it's actually quite nice, even though I'm in a colouring book. It's really nice to to be doing a bit of painting. That was one of the reasons why I did the um the watercolouring ticket to dreams as well. I think I was getting watercolour withdrawal. Who'd have thunk it? I still say though I'm I'm not a painter. I am not a painter. Put pencils in my hand and you could ask me to do anything and I'd probably be able to execute it. Paint not so much. But it's fun trying. So and I think that, you know, the thing, especially about hobby art, it doesn't really matter what it looks like as long as you're happy with what you've achieved. And that goal could be just to finish a, a colouring page or it could be to draw something that you've never drawn before. It doesn't matter because there is no law in the land that says you have to show it to anybody. It's only for your personal satisfaction. And uh, I have lots of, I mean, I share a lot of my art on, on my Instagram. You guys will have seen stuff that I've not, you know, I've not necessarily filmed or whatever. But there is a lot of stuff that I will not put on social media because it's, it's maybe not up to my general art standard. And maybe I was trying something new or maybe I decided I made a huge mistake picking a colour palette. And... You, you know, you've got to respect your own privacy for stuff like that. Just because you finish something doesn't mean that you need to, you know, announce it to the whole world. I mean, there's some things as well that I've drawn and I haven't even showed my husband. And it's not because I'm ashamed of it. It's just, it's not, you know, it's like exercises or things that maybe aren't a f what I would consider a full piece. And especially if you're learning as well. I mean, I've got lots of exercises, like drawing exercises and stuff. And let's be realistic, nobody's going to want to see those anyway. Would you like to see a page of 56 ovals? Nah. <laughs> so, you know, you don't have to be hard on yourself at all. But this is really nice today. It's quite relaxing. I'm really excited to get this finished as well. I've got um I've got a few things that I'm colouring that I would like to sort of focus on for a wee while. As I say, I'm I'm not gonna do another nameplate page straight away because you guys have just been inundated with these videos and I'm pretty sure you must be getting fed up with them by now, especially Hannah Carlson, because we seem to do a lot with her books. So, you know, we're go we're gonna go and do some other colouring stuff for a for a wee while, even if it's just for a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to that change as well. And obviously that change will come about when this is finished. So that's one of the reasons why I'm excited to finish it. You wouldn't have realised I was away there because by the magic of editing. But uh, I had to go and put my oven on. <laughs> we are having a, a roast tonight. And I need to... I saw the time and I was like, oh, better get that in the oven. <laughs> so I had to nip through and go and stick my oven on which is, it's unsettled all the dogs. They were all, they were all lying in the cave round about me and they were all sleeping and now we're very much awake. So I'm just waiting to see if they're going to settle down again. It's not been that long since we've been out on our W-A-L-K, can't say the word. And uh, with the weather being the way it is, it's, it's very, very warm for the, the dogs, so they tire quite quickly. But... Although they tire quite quickly, they also recover once they're back in the house, 
where it's a bit cooler. They recover a lot quicker as well and they're ready to bounce about again, you know, quite soon. So everybody's just lounging at the moment. So <laughs> we'll just keep going while they're quiet. There we go. I've got too much paint on my brush here. There we go, that's better. This is actually a wee bit too thick. I need to add some more water to my pan. It's getting a bit gloopy. And we don't want gloopy paint. You can see where I've gone over the line work slightly with that one. And that's a that is a prime example of a place where I would use my fine liner just to just to sort of tidy it up. It's not really that noticeable, to be honest. I mean, I'd probably get away with it again because this is like a, a repeating pattern. It's not as if it's just, you know, one thing that's the focal point in the middle of the page. So I, I might not even bother. I'll, I'll wait until I'm finished and just see how, how I feel about it. It might be one of those ones that it'll bug me because I know it's there. <laughs> I'm sure some of you have experienced that in your lifetime. Like people say to you, nah, it's not noticeable at all. You're like, yes, but I know it's there. I have to fix it. There we go. So tomorrow I was looking at the weather forecast because I don't know how much longer I can deal with this horrendous weather. Apparently tomorrow it's to be very warm and sunny, which will be the first day in weeks where we've actually had a proper summer's day. So I'm going to take full advantage of that tomorrow. I am taking the afternoon off my work and I'm going to sit in my garden and I'm going to drink beer. I might draw some pictures as well. It depends how windy it is. We do, where we, where the farm sits, we're, we've got a kind of exposed bit and if the wind whistles the wrong way, although it's warm to sit in uh, the minute you have any paper in the vicinity, it just starts flying about. So I shall wait and see what direction the wind is going in before I decide whether or not I'm going to do any arting. But I'd really like just to sit with my sketchbook and a beer in the sunshine and just just do some doodling. Nothing spectacular. Just me, a graphite pencil and my sketchbook. And maybe I needed a razor. <laughs> that sounds like fun. It also depends as well as what's what's happening in the yard tomorrow um, because the yard is directly behind our house. So if I'm sitting in the garden, I hear all the, all the farm noises, all the tractors and all the animals and all that kind of thing. And that can kind of ruin your relaxation, you know. <laughs> right, I'll pop back up here now and give this a chance to dry down the bottom. Move my wee palette around as well. But as I say, I'm just trying to enjoy this sort of quieter time. Mr. Jim is on with, <laughs> he's on with building a shed. That's what's taken up his time just now because it is a quiet time of year in terms of the the animals. So he decided he's just going to get his shed put up, which is going to have cows in it come the winter. So it needs to be done before the winter. So now is as good a time as any. But uh, so he spends a lot of time this last week, he spent a lot of time dotting about, you know, he's been in and out because he's been to to pick up supplies and one thing and another. So um, he's kind of zipping about. I went to see Agnes yesterday. For those of you that have watched my my farm update video in the springtime, you'll know who Agnes is. And uh, she she was stood at the fence when I when I took the dogs out the other day, and uh, so I went over and talked to her and gave her a wee pet, and her calf is absolutely massive. It's a boy. We thought it was a girl at first, and it's a boy, and he's huge. He is absolutely massive. So that's good. Everybody is well. She still likes a good scratch. She's a wee bit um a wee bit more sort of wary now because Pip likes to bark at the cows if they come too close to her. So if she sees Pip, she kind of like you know, looks at me as if to say, I'm not coming any closer and it's not because I don't like you, it's because I don't like your dog. <laughs> but uh, so I gave her a little stroke yesterday. A wee scratch behind her ears and scratched her bum for her and she was quite happy, so that was good. Yeah, the, the the thing about our calf, we we actually, the 
because of the layout of the shed and the way the, the calves are born, you know, they're born in a sort of communal area, we actually had the wrong ear tag and the wrong calf. And their, their ear tag is basically their, you know, like their own unique identification and they have their own passports, cows have passports. And we realised that when the, the other calf that was born around the same time, we realised once they'd got slightly bigger, when I say slightly bigger, I mean when they were a few days old, that they'd swapped over and they were with the, like the opposite mothers. So the one that we thought belonged to Agnes belonged to another cow and vice versa. So it turns out her calf was a boy, so he doesn't have a name. Um, <laughs> not that he needs a name. We, we don't routinely name all our, our calves. We just name some of the, the girls. And obviously Agnes is one of them. We do have a cow called Peanut. I have no idea how she got her name. She was here when we arrived. But she is a bad-tempered old so-and-so. You do not want to be anywhere near her if you can help it. Because she is one grumpy old cow. And she is old. So I don't know whether she was grumpy before she got old or getting old made her grumpy. But she's she's not a pleasure to work with in the slightest. And if she needs, you know, anything done with her, you know, like if she maybe she needs her feet trimmed or she needs vaccinated, you know, it's just like, oh, do we have to do this? <laughs> she's not, not the pleasantest animal to work with. In general, though, most of the cows are wary and they are a bit sort of fearful of humans, but they're they're very nosy, you know, they're very inquisitive animals, but working with them, you, the more you handle them, the calmer they'll become. And we often say that you can tell the personality of a farmer by the behaviour of their animals, because farmers who scream and shout and stamp their feet and you know handle their animals by instilling fear the the herd tends to be very flighty and very fearful whereas if you have a very soft calm you know like soft spoken soft natured farmer the cows tend to be quite quiet and you can walk in amongst them or whatever and that's quite often the case so most of our cows are pretty good natured you know they, they still don't like you sticking needles in them and things but you know we only do that as a necessity for for the herd health but uh, we, we do have one or two bad tempered ones. The exception is obviously when they calf, you know, when they have their babies, the mothers are very, very protective. And that's not a reflection on their personality. That's them doing their job. So you can't judge them <laughs> on on their behaviour just after they've had a baby because that's not fair. Um, you just have to be very careful. And again, some are more trusting than others. Agnes would let us touch her baby almost straight away. To begin with, she was a bit unsure about us going in the pen beside her. But she, you know, after a few minutes, gave her a little stroke, she was absolutely fine. And that was okay. But yeah, bad-tempered cows are not good. They are not good. We used to have a, a cow, the, the farm that I worked at when I was a student. There was a cow that used to lull you into a full sense of security. You know, she'd let you stroke her back and... You could, like, you know, pet her and talk to her. And then once you'd let your guard down, she would kick you. And she would she would kick out when you were walking past her. Even if you were, like, nowhere near her and you weren't approaching her or you weren't going to touch her. But if you were in the vicinity and she thought that maybe you hadn't seen her or you weren't paying attention to her, she'd try and kick you. You know, she'd kick out with her back feet. And it was I always used to say it was just out of sheer badness and nothing else. She's just a bad tempered cantankerous old so and so. Um and she she was a great mother. Her her calves were always the cleanest calves in the pens. They were always, you know, she really looked after her babies. But man, she was bad tempered. And she's another one. She was like a she was like the school bully. When the girls got fed, they used to get fed in like long troughs. So, you know, they would all go in, in a line along beside each other. And she would just push everyone out of the way so she could get in. And she didn't care who she was pushing out of the way. She used to push the bull out of the way as well. I'll never forget her. She's quite a character. And she did not, like, if you had to, like, when, the, when we were trimming their feet. Because when they're inside in the winter, if they've been on straw... Their, their their hoofs grow as a bit like toenails so they do get long and you need to sort of either put them out onto hard concrete so that they wear down or you need to trim them and if you had to get the foot trimmer in oh my goodness 
that was uh, that was great fun as well. I very rarely, well, I, I never trimmed her feet for her. Um, my boss used to do it, but you or she did not like it at all. And it used to take us like four times as long to, to sort her feet out than we were with everyone else because she wouldn't stay still. And she's still trying to kick you. <laughs> Even though you've got hold of her foot, she's still trying to kick you. Oh, the joys. I was going to move to the bigger brush for this section, but I'm actually okay with this brush. It's allowing me to be quite, quite accurate and quite precise. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna change it up. I was trying to avoid those tiny little circles, and I've literally just put my paintbrush over it. Dag damn it. Okay, let's see what we can do here. This is re uh, this is really testing my skills now because this is a tight space. Again, the temptation is to reach for an even smaller paintbrush, but I think by the time I actually go and get the paintbrush and decide which one, I could probably just have this done. So I'm just gonna do it. Again, I'll pop in my, um, I'll pop in the line work again, just with a, a fine liner. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna agonize too much over this because, well, it's tiny. That's not bad at all. That's a pr that's pretty solid effort. Yep, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, we're getting on quite well with this now. I really, really like these Gansai Tambi paints. I know people have said to me that the uh, the fine tech paints are really good as well. And I think if I hadn't got these in a scroller box so early on when I started arting, I probably would have gotten the fine tech paints. But the minute I tried these, I started getting a scroller box subscription in November. And I think these came in the the December or the January box. I can't really remember. And the minute I started using them, I was like, oh, I am in love with these paints. <laughs> so I've never really felt the need to, to get the fine tech ones, although I have heard that they're they're very, very nice. I did have the set of the the starry colours one, which is the, you know, like the different coloured ones. And they were nice as well, but I just found I wasn't using them. Whereas I find that I use these gold ones all the time. So um but they are nice. They do a gem colours one as well. So I think the, the pearl colours obviously are pearlescent. And I don't know about the gem colours. So I've never had them. Which is ironic considering they are my namesake. Maybe I should get them just for fun. <laughs> uh, honestly though I don't think I would use them all that often. But these golds are nice. If you buy the big set of the Gansai Tambi watercolours. I think it's... <sighs> I think I think there's some in the thirty six set, um. But yeah, you, you do get some of these golds, and you know in the big watercolor palette. So, that was one of the reasons why I didn't want the big palette because obviously I already had these before, before I got the other paints. The other paints were a gift from my my mum for my birthday one year. Um. But yeah, I highly recommend them. And because the pans are massive as well, I mean they're absolutely huge. The paint lasts, you know, forever. And that's the one thing I really like about them. Just pop a little bit more of this in. Some people find this, you know, doing things like this really stressful and I actually find it the opposite. I find it very relaxing. Oh, I was way over the line there. Ooh. Which is interesting because I am not a fan of repeating patterns. I hate doing mandalas and things. But see, just painting little circles like this. I don't know why, it's just really relaxing. Really nice. Plus as well, we don't have that much to do actually. I thought this was going to take me a lot longer than this. I had, I had budgeted a lot more, <laughs> a lot more time than this. I do have to go and put my roast in the oven though. I'm going to finish these off and then I will go and sort out dinner and that will give this a little bit of drying time and I'll just bring you guys back in once it's dry and I've finished farting about in my kitchen. <laughs> 
my mum's Canadian friend, like, she says, um, you know, if, if you're kind of, like, messing about in the kitchen, you're not really doing anything in particular, she says puttering, you know, to putter about, whereas we say potter about, which I just think is quite interesting. Um, I don't know why that popped into my head there. I think it's because I said I was going to go and fart about in the kitchen. <laughs> Same thing. My husband was... Um, he likes to scroll through Facebook in the morning. I don't know why. I really don't know why. Because it's just, you know, pointless videos. and Anyway, that's his, that's his way of sort of waking up in the morning when he's sitting having his breakfast at the table. He likes to scroll through Facebook and watch silly videos. And uh, he found a, one of these sort of memes and it was, you know, you're Scottish when... And then it was all these words, like these Scottish words... Um, and you know the, the idea was that if you can pronounce them all then you're Scottish and my husband is English he's not Scottish and he managed I think there was about 15 of them and he managed like at least two thirds of them I was impressed but uh, it's quite entertaining but there were some phrases and things and I said to him I said I, I wouldn't even use those phrases you know there were like maybe like broad glass region phrases um, so there's things there, although I can pronounce them, I wouldn't necessarily use them because he said to me, oh, I've never heard that one before. Now, well, that's because it's not something I would use in the house. So, you know, why would you know about it kind of thing? Um, but it was quite funny. It was quite interesting. The one that he does use now, and it's it's really nice to hear him using Scottish words. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I've talked about this before, actually. He... If you, when a child's splashing about in the sink, we, we, t we say that they're having a skiddle, as in rhymes with griddle. And uh, if you, you know, sort of splash water over the sides or you want to wash your hands quickly, you'll say, I'll just go and have a skiddle in the sink. And he started using that now. I think it's hilarious. Pip likes to skiddle in our water bowl. We say that she's going snorkeling and she kind of paws at it and splashes it about. So she's going for a skiddle as well. <laughs> Okay, that is the first layer of paint. So I am going to go and tend to my pork joint and I shall be back momentarily. Okay, and we're back. I'm just having a wee feel to see what's dry. This is not quite dry, but we're getting there. So we're going to start over this other side. I'm just looking at the, the coverage on the paint and I don't think I'm going to have to go back over anything. So I'm just going to go in with my... 0 to micron which is a 0 0.3 millimeter line width and I've just tried to match it up as best I can with the line work in the picture and I'm just going to work my way methodically around and just tidy up any sort of areas where I think needs tidying like there it's not terribly exciting this part but as I say I think with with something like this you could actually get away with not doing it truthfully um, so I'm just going for the more sort of glaringly obvious areas where, it, you know, it sticks out a little bit more and I'm just literally tidying up tiny little sections. There aren't too many, thankfully. Thankfully. Oh, the concentration. Yep, that's not too bad. Down here as well. I've kind of gone over around this edge, but it's not. There we go. That's a little bit tidier. The same down here. Yeah, it was this one here. That was the doozy. <laughs> I'm actually surprised that there aren't more areas that, that I need to touch up. The first time I used that paint in a colouring book was in Ivy and the Inky Butterfly and I did spend quite a lot of time touching up my line work. Again, that was long before I started any form of painting or anything like that though, so it's no surprise really. I think I probably spent just as long going around with the, the fine liner as I did actually painting on the surface. Got this one down here. And there we go. Let's zoom out. And there we have it. Doesn't that look nice? Now, if I tilt this in the light, you will be able to see the gold. When you see it flat like that, it doesn't really do it justice, but you can see it in the light. And doing this is really nice because the front cover of this book as well also has gold in it. So, you know, that's kind of in keeping with the front. Now, I just have the final finishing touch. 
Obviously, I am going to put my own name in here, but for the purposes of this project, we have this. And I am now going to email this to Becky. Obviously, by the time you see this video, I'll have already emailed it to Becky. And that will be in time for the deadline for the entire HK5 project. And I am really looking forward to seeing all the books finished and what we can do collectively as a community. If you haven't checked out Becky's channel, she is Becky's Colour Escape. I will leave a link to her channel in the description. She does loads of colouring stuff and she does some live streams as well. So if you're into that kind of thing, you should go and check her out because she has the best ideas and this entire project was her idea so be sure to pop over there and you can tell her I sent you <laughs> all right guys thank you very much for watching I have really enjoyed doing this page it's fitted in with my challenge for myself as well as obviously for this community project too so we have killed two birds sorry guys not you guys <laughs> with one stone enjoy the rest of your day everyone and we'll see you next time bye